In this presentation, we're going to look at what economics is all about. We're going to look at it particularly through the lens of property, of ownership. If you think about why we study economics, why people are concerned about economics, what we see is that it all has to do one way or another with buying and selling things and getting the right price. We want to explore that a little bit further as we go along. Property is extremely important in economics because without ownership of things, without property rights in things, economics is rather meaningless because one way or another economics is about the way that people in society exchange the things that they need to live and to live well. When we look at this notion of property rights, we find there are two types of property. One type of property comes from the things that we make ourselves, and we can fairly clearly see that they belong to us. But probably the more important part of property in economics is property rights, ownership rights in things that nobody makes. And this is really what land is. We live in it, we're born into it, but we don't make it. We might develop it, we might build on it, but we don't actually make the land itself, even though it's very important. As our farms, as our mines, as the land our factory sits on, the land our houses uh, sit on, and our shops and offices and all the rest of it. Simply, we can't live without land. And one way or another, when we look around, we see that the price of land is often the most expensive uh, investment or purchase that the average person is likely to make in their life. It's also a very attractive form of investment for people that do have the advantage of having more money than they need to spend on themselves to keep alive. And one way or another, uh, land is, is really a key part of all of our economic lives. Where does the price of land come from? If we look at the price of land, the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that the price has something to do with the nature of our ownership. If we own everything about the land, we own more of it than if we say only own the surface of the land or the right to live on the land for a certain limited number of years in a lease. If we own the mineral rights, that changes our values. There are many things that uh, change the value of land depending on what kind of ownership we have. And certainly between what we call freehold ownership and leasehold ownership, we can see a massive difference in the value of our property rights and really quite a number of puzzles for the property valuer. And so property title, the way we own and what we own and how society recognises our ownership is really key to the whole question of the value of land. Now, if land is important as a component in the economy, and we can see that property rights, land property rights, becomes an important hidden foundation in all of the economic problem. When we start to ask questions about where does property title come from, we either say, well, it's always been here, it was here before I was born, it'll probably be here after I leave. It's the easy way out. But to really understand it, we have to dig a little bit deeper. We see that in Australia, we use the Torren system of freehold property in most parts of Australia. In some parts, such as the ACT, we use leasehold, still with a Torrens type of property system. What can we say about what we learn from seeing these property title systems? Well, first of all, they really come from the government by way of various legal uh, acts of uh, our government, and it's administered by the legal profession. And so we can see that the legal and governmental systems of our society are really what govern our whole property rights arrangement. And if property rights are the foundation of uh, our ownership and therefore of price, property rights sitting on uh, the legal governmental system is really the foundation of our whole economic system. So far, so good. If we really want to understand where these things come from, we have to dig a little bit deeper as well. And this is really the, um, the, the, the adventure, the challenge of what we're going to be doing in studying property and political economy 
because in this we're going to say where do these um, legal and governmental uh, decisions come from and we're going to see that it has something to do with culture it has something to do with values and for many people especially our um, you know indigenous brothers we find that it has to do with their understanding of the origin of things in general so what it says ultimately is that to understand property economics or economics in general we have to understand a lot of things which don't initially appear to have direct bearing on our discipline but in fact when we think a bit deeper to understand what's behind our discipline we really have to be on top of these other things as well and this is really the stuff of political economy let's look a little bit more now at property we've already noticed that property has a prime economic function it's the most important and valuable investment most people make you can't have a farm without land you can't have a mine without land it's very difficult to have a factory without land to sit it on and if you look around especially a capital city we see that the distribution of land and land use is critical to the efficiency of the city the efficiency of its economic performance land can also have other functions as well as the economic function we see that especially with indigenous people where it has ceremonial rights or traditional uh, meaning and so on we can also see this to a certain extent in our own history if you think back to your fondest memories of your childhood you'll probably find it's associated with a particular place often as people grow up they think back to the house they lived in or the place they went to on their holidays and so land can have these additional functions and for some cultures these additional functions can even be more important than the economic functions when we scratch a little deeper into the nature of our property ownership our attachment to property we see that ultimately it's determined by society the Torrens title system that we mentioned earlier is really a convention set up by our society to more efficiently manage property rights it's only a couple of hundred years old and before that there was a different system organized by a society you know in its time if we look at different societies around the world we see that they have sometimes radically different approaches to property rights and so we can't say that there is you know one way one answer it's like uh, water always has hydrogen and oxygen in its composition can we say that about property unfortunately not because property is simply an arbitrary decision an arbitrary convention set up by a society much the same way as clothing or food or music are very often determined by the society in which you find them because property is a product an artifact of its society its culture it changes and this is very important for the property economists to understand because property has changed over time it is changing as we speak certainly in your lifetime and it will change into the future now to really understand how to get the best out of property economically obviously it's important to understand those changes what caused them in the past what will cause them in the future and so really to be a good property economist means that we have to understand social change in order to understand where society's use of property through those changes is going to go into the future developers spend a lot of time thinking about where society is going into the future no point in subdividing a, um, uh, a farm out the other side of Ningen if Ningen is going to consider to be a tiny little country town if you know that there's going to be some change there say a mine opening or a military facility being established in other words some action of other parts of society the decision to develop there might be totally different now we come to a more general question and that's the question of why we study economics at all I want to step away from the idea of property for just a moment think about why do we have economists why does the Reserve Bank of Australia or the Commonwealth government or the AMP Society 
Why do they have economists? And why do we pay attention to them? Are economists people that are there to simply make the um, AMP society more profitable? Or are they there to do something else? And is the economics function that's served by our government when they consider the budget or other uh, governmental decisions? The economic dimension, what are they doing there? Well, if we think about why we have some respect for economists, why we employ them at all, it's because we have a desire to better organise the material relations between people. That's a fairly formal definition, but if you take it apart, you see it tells us a lot. Society is made up of relationships between people. Some of those are social relationships. Some of them are cultural. Some of them have to do with the way we exchange material things. The social relationships that have to do with the exchange of material things is what we study in economics. And the object is really to provide a better solution to the economic problem, the exchange of material things for the people in society. In other words, for the people in society to be wealthier, perhaps a more equal distribution or a more just distribution or a distribution which rewards people in proportion to their effort. All of those solutions are all aimed at making society a better place, whatever we understand better to mean. Therefore, it really has to do with, first of all, understanding what good, better, best means. We find that that has to do with notions of justice, notions of fairness, notions having to do with understanding what humans are about, how to motivate them. Does communism motivate people? Most people don't think so. Does capitalism motivate people? It certainly does. What are the upsides and the downsides of those two radically different approaches? Do they both have the end of a just and fair distribution of goods and services? They may reward people, or some of them might, for their effort. Some of them may not. Some of them may cause wealth to concentrate into smaller and smaller number of hands, which cause great misery, perhaps. And people have been debating these questions literally for centuries, really millennia. So one way or another, the study of economics has to do with the study of justice and fairness and society. Unfortunately, economics itself doesn't do very well in that area because it has limited itself in a very narrow way in recent times. By recent times, I mean the last century or so. At most, our current discipline of economics only goes back about two and a half centuries, around the time of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, the French physiocrats, around the mid 1700s to the beginning of the 1800s is really where modern economics got its start. However, we've been talking about economics and economic problems for a long time. I want to introduce you to one of the very first economists, the first major writer in the area of economic thought. His name was Aristotle. He lived uh, about four and a half centuries before Christ in Greece. He is outstanding as one of the three fathers of our major philosophical system. The other two were Plato and Socrates, and we might speak about them later on. But Aristotle had the distinction of giving us a number of very well thought out and argued economic principles. And it turns out that we see the principles that Aristotle gave us, echoing down through the centuries, lurking within the very foundations of contemporary economic thought one way or another. And so it's a good idea to be um, aware of what Aristotle gave us. To begin with, Aristotle gave us the name economics. Only in Greek, it's pronounced something more like oikonomiki. And that word in Greek means the art of household management, because Aristotle realized that there was a parallel between the way that a person might organize his household, remembering that the Greek household uh, consisted of a large number of people, more than simply mum, dad and the kids, 
really an extended household would probably think of it, and it was usually rural, and it resembled something like a small village. It was headed by the father of the family, and we're going to be talking about that in a later class, a later presentation. The art of household management. It meant that Aristotle studied economics very much from the perspective of the appropriate relations between persons in a community, in this little microscopic community of the household, maybe 20, 30, 50 people. Aristotle looked at the importance of a community as really the foundation for society, as opposed to the notion of association. We think of these two words as both possibilities for how we set up a society. When we think a little bit deeper though, we find that an association is a very different thing to a community. When you have an association, you have something like a football club um, or a business, a situation where you have a number of people coming together with some benefit that they see in being a part of the association. And if they don't get that benefit, they'll leave. If I join a soccer club, I might do it for my sport, my interest, and so on. And if the club doesn't perform very well, I'll go and find another club. And we move in and out of associations, out of our um, places of work, out of the uh, other associations we live, depending on whether or not they serve our purposes. It's a little bit different with a household, with a family. And this is more like a community. A community is a group of people that stick together because of common um, values, a common sense of belonging. And we can see that with a family. You will always be your father's son or daughter. You'll always have your brothers and sisters and so on. Families are not something that you can walk away with. You can, you can walk away from a family physically, but you can't really abandon your family. And somehow, and certainly we see this in psychology, that people who do walk away from their family are usually worse off as a result. So this notion of a family model, a household model, as the basis for our society is very important. Aristotle could see that. And he recognized that a society had to be considered as something like a big community, a big household, a big family. When we look at community um, and a household uh, and we look at history, we can see that the notion of solidarity, of sticking together, is very, very important. Whereas when we think of an association, we think primarily of the individual pursuing something as a result of self-interest, of contracts and partnerships, and the dissolution of the association if the contract is not met. So Aristotle gave us this beginning insight into the nature of society, and then he applied that to uh, the economic problem. He also saw that the notion of property was fundamental, especially property in things that we don't make ourselves, in our land and so on. Aristotle gave us what he called the dual theory of property. It's a curious thing, and it's really quite an insight. Aristotle looked at different communities that he was aware of, different countries, if you like, the city-states of what we now call Greece. And he could see that different city-states, different communities, organize their property in one of two different ways. We would see them as parallel, very strongly parallel in some ways, to the way that land is organized within socialist communities or what we might call capitalist societies. Aristotle also looked at the question of trade, of commerce. And he could see that there were some situations when we bought and sold things that seemed to embody a degree of fairness and justice. There are other situations where we bought and sold maybe the same things, uh, maybe you know at the point of a gun or something, where the relationship was not exactly fair and just. There is a um, commerce that happens when a bush ranger holds up a stagecoach and takes all the money and the gold. The deal is, and the contract to a certain extent, is that the bush ranger takes the gold and um, he repays the, uh, the benevolence of the people on the stagecoach by not shooting them. It's a kind of contract, not especially fair. So we can have commerce, which is not fair. Maybe that's an extreme case. 
although Aristotle would say that the ideal relationships are one which do embody some kind of fairness. And the last element in the economy that Aristotle considered was the question of money, what it was, how to use it. And so we find that out of all these, Aristotle gave us a number of philosophical principles because Aristotle is remembered as a philosopher. And if those principles, those concepts of right and wrong, of justice and fair play, are um, kept according to Aristotle, the society, the community, uh, will prosper. We're going to look at Aristotle's insights in this regard in further detail as we move along. Uh, just before we go, I'll just talk a little bit about the dual theory of property. Aristotle's dual theory of property consisted of the notion that property should be privately owned. And you'd say, that's good, because that's the way we do it in Australia, and experience has shown that private ownership works very well for human societies. However, Aristotle added to this something which we often don't notice, we often take for granted. And that is that Aristotle suggested that in some way, property also should be used in common. That sounds really peculiar. He's saying you can have private ownership, absolutely, but not absolute private property. And because he says you have to have private ownership with a degree of common use. Now, if we think about that, and we will be later on, we'll see that it brings up a kind of puzzle, a sort of halfway. We actually see it in the way that in some cases in Australia, we pay a percentage of our rent in things like local government rates um, and also in land tax. And those taxes and rates go towards supporting the community. What this means is that while I might own my house, the community in general gets the use of a little bit of the rent of my house in order to put tar on the roads and build uh, public buildings, libraries and whatnot, and uh, electric lights, I guess, um, down the street. All of these things we take for granted. We pay for those sometimes uh, through a rent in our land. Also, in a way, a farmer, when he sells his crop, while it's his land, the fact that he is providing the benefits of his crop, whether it's wool or wheat or whatever, to the community, the community gets to have their um, lamb pies um, because they're able to, if you like, use the farmer's property where the lamb comes from and the wheat to make the pastry from the farmer. So there's this sort of sense of common use. It's a curious and rather subtle observation of Aristotle, and we'll be coming back to it later on. I said that economics has only really taken shape in the last century or so, and at most the last two and a half centuries. I want to look at some of the peculiarities of economics as a discipline. When you first started your study of economics, you would have learnt that econ economics is all about the way that we manage our insatiable desires, because the economic actor in modern economic theory is a self-interested individual who simply has insatiable desires that they're trying to satisfy to the best of their ability. I want to get us to think now about how reasonable that definition is. Certainly, I would like to have two shirts rather than one. But do I want 10 shirts or 100 shirts or 1,000 shirts? At some point, owning shirts is something which becomes more of a problem than a benefit. If I had 10,000 shirts, I'd probably forget which one was which. Certainly wouldn't need a washing machine. And it's the same with other things. How many cars would I like? I'm rather fond of four-wheel drives. How many land cruisers do I want? Well, maybe one, because after all, that's as many as I could drive at a time. Sometimes I like sports cars. How many sports cars do I want? Well, maybe two or three. Uh, maybe like a Lamborghini and a nice open-top Ferrari. 
But after I had half a dozen sports cars in my garage sitting next to my four-wheel drive, I'd probably get sick of them and they'd be getting in the way. And really anything else that we can think of, or at least most things, we actually have a limit to our desire for them. Ice cream is one fairly obvious one. I might really like a bowl of ice cream or a, um, ice cream from the shop. I might even have two if it's a really hot day. Do I want five or 10 or 20? At some point, that'd make me sick. And certainly, simply desiring them, certainly when it gets to 100, you'd say, well, we better take Small off to uh, see a psychiatrist or something because there's something wrong with him. People do not have infinite desires. We have limited desires because what we're really wanting is to live a good life, which is a balance of many things. A motor car here, a bowl of ice cream there, a nice clothes somewhere else, and so on. When we unpack that, what we see is the very foundation of our modern economic thought, which is this economic actor, the rational self-interested individual, sometimes referred to as homo economicus, really is very unrealistic. And if we pursue the discipline of economics based on this very inhuman, perhaps psychotic uh, human economic actor, then our uh, conclusions from that study might be as inappropriate as using the conclusions from playing the board game Monopoly uh, would be in directing our life as a property developer or as an asset manager. What we need is an economic study which conforms to the nature of the economic actor. Another uh, important element in modern economics is the notion of the perfect market. We're going to look at this question a little bit uh, more in detail shortly. The last question we're going to um, raise is the mysterious question of capital gain in land. One way or another, land is now the most valuable part of most real estate assets. The building tends to be the cheap part. Uh, if we look around residences, say in Sydney, we find in even the cheapest parts where you might be able to buy a house for maybe say half a million dollars, typically the house part of the property will be worth no more than about $100,000. The land is worth the rest. In other words, about 80%. If we go to other parts of the city of Sydney, where a house that might look almost identical will cost you two or $3 million, we find the same kind of balance, or at least the same kind of value of the house, and that the house might still be only worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars, at the most, and yet the property might be worth two or three million dollars. And so, depending on where you are in Sydney, land might be somewhere between um, 80 to you know 95 percent of the value of property. And it's getting more valuable all the time. How does it become more valuable? Very interesting question. It's almost the opposite of all of our other assets. If I own a car, unless it's a very rare and special one, it will become less valuable over time. And the same with my shirts and my shoes and my ice cream. But land does the opposite. Okay, I hope in these last few slides I've raised a few questions and maybe rattled um, the economics cage a little tiny bit. I now want to start to put in place a few answers. I want to talk about the discipline of political economy. Political economy is the larger discipline from which modern economics has been derived. Political economy is a study which includes economics, also politics, and really puts them all into an ethical framework. Originally, when people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo were writing what we would now call economics, they were working as philosophers, especially as moral philosophers. 
Adam Smith especially, was a professor of moral philosophy. It just happened that one of his topics of interest had to do with the economic side of morals. And that discipline was called political economy. We saw in our, well, one of our first slides that economics is mediated through legal and government institutions, and it's based on culture, and it comes down to values. What are values? Values are ethics or moral uh, questions. We're going to have to look a little bit further at what ethics and moral philosophy is all about. But really, that's what we're looking at uh, with political economy. Political economy enables us to use this larger lens of understanding our society and philo uh, philosophy, particularly moral philosophy, to better understand the whole economic process, where it's come from, where it's going, uh, how to use it for that matter. And by using that larger lens, we're able to have far more mastery over our discipline in this case, property economics. Political economy was the forerunner of economics. Economics pulled away from political economy by basically taking the question of property rights, value and exchange, and trying to turn it into a science more like physics or chemistry than like the study of society and ethics. And we're going to be exploring uh, how successful that has been as we go along. To do that, economics has made a number of assumptions. Before we leave um, political economy, I want to give some definitions. A nice crisp definition of political economy is that it is the study of appropriate relations between persons with respect to commercial activity. Now, we need to take apart that definition. The study of appropriate relations between persons is the classical definition of a moral principle. So political economy is the study of those principles, those moral principles that pertain to economic relationships. When we look at the second part of the definition, uh, relations between persons with respect to commercial activity, we can see the economic dimension coming in. What we're saying is we're looking at the moral issues, the issues of fairness and justice, how to motivate, how to respond to the reality of the human person, the reality of their natural property rights and so on, in the way that they deal with other people, they relate to other people, uh, and that is through commercial activity, the buying and selling, uh, the working for other people and so on. Political economy is focused on trade as a human activity. One of the things you'll notice in modern economics is that we talk about the market a lot and what the market is doing and market forces and so on. Almost as though the market is some sort of a inanimate machine, a mechanism which doesn't have human beings crawling around inside it. When we look a little bit closer though at the reality, we find that every market transaction is in fact in a relationship, a transaction between two human people and with all the complexities of humanity behind their respective buyers and sellers. And so we have to look at this notion of a human activity, human action embedded in social and ethical structures. The object of political economy is the good. Now to understand this, we have to understand what good means. We all know what good is, at least we think we do, but what is it really? Let's look at some unusual places where we use the notion of good. We talk about white goods. If you want to buy a washing machine or a refrigerator, we'll go to some discount warehouse and buy our refrigerator. And what section do we go to? The white goods section. What's a white good? Well, in the old days, before they were all made out of stainless steel, uh, they typically were a metal box painted white and when you plugged it in and switched it on, it did something good for you. It made your life more comfortable. So we can call a washing machine a white good because it is good for our life. If I go into a supermarket, I'll find one corner of the supermarket will sell things like salami. I am very fond of salami. What's salami? 
Its generic name is one of the small goods. What's the relationship between a washing machine and salami? They're both called goods. What does this good really mean? Good is something which causes our life to be better. A salami makes my lunch considerably more enjoyable. A washing machine makes my laundry activities far more tolerable. And we can see that with everything that is good. Aristotle pondered this whole question and saw that our object of our life was happiness. And everything that we do, one way or another, directly or indirectly, is ordered towards increasing and maximizing our happiness. What makes us happy? Well, those things that make us happy are things that are good for us. And so everything that I think of as good is something that makes my life or the life of the community in general better. When we use the word good in a moral or ethical sense, we're talking about some activity, some relationship, which helps the life of the people involved. Good outcomes for the individuals, good outcomes for the community. If political economy has to do with the good, improving the quality of life for the individual and the community, then we're going to be considering justice, which is really the action of good in relationship, in particular in the marketplace for consumables and also the marketplace for productive factors. When we're talking about the marketplace, and now we're thinking about the marketplace more in a human sense, we have to think of the question of price. Because after all, if I go down the street to buy or sell something, the really important question I have is not necessarily what I'm buying or selling. I mean, that's relatively obvious. The really important thing which causes the sale to happen or to not happen is getting the price right. And this is now one of the main problems in economics. It's also a big question in political economy. Economics deals with it by looking at graphs in the intersection of supply and demand functions and things like that. Political economy uses a different approach, perhaps a deeper approach. I want you to think of this prep problem of price. If I go down the street to buy a bottle of milk, I have an idea that I need a bottle of milk. It, it is something that is going to make my life better. It's a good thing for me. And I have a value associated with it. Value is related to the notion of good. Because something which is valuable or more valuable is something which is going to be better for me. Something which has some value is something which is going to be good for me. So when I go down the street, I have this idea that, yes, I really want to have Cornflakes for breakfast, so I need my milk. Here's something's going to make my life good. And so I have value on it. Value, one way or another, has to do with usefulness to the user. When I go down the street to buy my bottle of milk, I am thinking about my life and how my life is going to be better. It really has to do with my estimate of what is going to make my situation more enjoyable. The odd thing about the milk is that its only real value is to the person who drinks it or swims in it or whatever you're going to do with it. It actually doesn't have the same value to the person who is selling it. After all, does the farmer who milks the cows, is he going to drink the milk? How does he enjoy it? What a different way. And if it wasn't that someone wanted to drink it, the farmer probably wouldn't be bothered milking the cows in the first place. We need to go a little bit further into that as we go along. But for the present, I just want to get you to think about, to recognise that value has to do with good. It's a, ultimately a moral term. It has to do with something which one way or another makes my life a bit better. And it really is a property of the consumer, not the producer. The producer values the milk in a very different way. Uh, we don't want to muddy the terms at present, uh, but just focus on the way that value has to do with the use of the thing. And it's something which is in the uh, 
the consumer, the buyer, the eventual user. From the farmer's point of view, let's say milking the cows early in the morning, producing the milk comes at a cost. He has to wake up early in the morning, he has to trudge around, make sure all the fences are fixed, um, move the cows in, move the cows out, do everything else that the cows that he's got to do to keep them producing the milk. It's hard work, it's uncomfortable, it's something he'd probably prefer to do. And realistically, he only gets to enjoy directly a microscopic percentage of the milk that he produces. And so most of the milk that the farmer produce, all he sees it as really a cost, an inconvenience. And one way or another to get him to wake up in the morning early and go off and organise his cows and do all the other things he has to fill his day with, he has to be rewarded sufficiently to make it worth his while to go out and do that. And so from the producer's point of view, we can see that fundamentally the issue when he takes his milk to market is not one of value, of the delight of having milk on his cornflakes or in his coffee or what have you. His perspective is more in terms of the cost that he must be rewarded for in order to make it worth his while to do. And so we have two limits, if you like. We have the cost that has to be rewarded in order for the farmer to be bothered doing what he does. And we have the value, which is the enhancement of life, which the eventual consumer is considering, kind of in their heart or in their mind or in their taste buds, whatever it is. They're the limits. If you try and sell the milk for a greater price than the user, the eventual consumer, attaches to the value of having milk in their cereal, then they'll go off and do something else. They'll put fruit juice on their, on their cornflakes or something. Or maybe they'll have toast instead. If, and so the, the sale simply won't happen. Um, if the um, farmer isn't able to get sufficient return from his milk uh, to cover his costs and make it worth his while getting up in the morning and do all those other inconvenient things. He'll probably go out and sell the cows or shoot them or something or eat them. Uh, so one way or another, these provide the, the limits. The lower limit is the reward for the, the cost and the upper limit is the, uh, the limit to the goodness that the product provides to the, the ultimate consumer. What does that tell us for the question of price though? Well, all it does is say that price is going to be somewhere in between. The price which will cause the farmer to sell his milk and the person who's wanting um, to, to bring it home to drink it, uh, cause those to actually close a sale, is I have to have a price that's somewhere between those two limits. The cost um, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the thing to produce and the value to the user. One of the things that we can see in the cost, by the way, before we go too far, is that cost tends to be in the thing. It's what brings the thing to existence. Okay. Price um, doesn't really have a limit. It just has this range. It's a payment for trade. It lives somewhere between the cost and the value. And it's a result of some sort of behavior, some relationship. And really what we see here is that we've established two limits, the lower limit and the upper limit. When we move on um, from Aristotle, and really this is a very Aristotelian way of looking at the uh, situation of relationship, we move to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, oddly enough, changed the terminology. He said that... Um, all of these things were different forms of value. And we still tend to use the Adam Smith terminology to some extent. Instead of value as value, as the philosophical notion of how the use of a thing contributes to the quality of life of the consumer, uh, Smith would describe it as use value because he would see a number of other values coming in as well. In particular, the cost to the farmer, Smith rephrased that as cost value, as the money number associated with the cost. 
And lastly, he gave us the idea of market value as price. And somehow, market value is meant to reflect these other two numbers. Now, the curious thing about this is that value and cost are always going to be different numbers. We can't relate them both to a single notion of value or market value, because one way or another, the farmer has a minimum value that he'll sell his milk for. He probably doesn't have a maximum value. And so the idea of cost as a value is a kind of open-ended thing. It has a minimum limit. And we can say the same thing about true use value, if you like to use Smith's term. Why did Adam Smith do this? Well, that's a question that we probably want to think about and maybe come back to over time. But to give you a little bit of a hint, it was basically to hide the distinction, the what a philosopher would call the metaphysical distinctions between these three terms. We'll get back to that at another time. Before we do that, though, we really need to think a little bit about this question of cost. Now, a lot of people misunderstand cost, or at least the cost that we're using it here. We're particularly going to be using a term which, strictly speaking, in economics, in modern economic jargon, would be referred to as normal cost. The normal cost is the price associated with the production of a thing which is sufficient to make it worth the producer's while to produce it without returning an excess. If the producer happens to be a public company, normal cost is defined as that price that the company sells its product for that maintains a stable, real share value. It means that the company is going to purr along, it's going to return sufficient profit to its shareholders, that their shareholders' share value remains a stable, real price. In other words, it, it will try to rise up with inflation, but no more. It means that the company is going to be very solid, it's not going to fail, um, because it's, it's returning sufficient uh, profit to satisfy all of its you know, needs, uh, the way the average cost of capital and those things that you learn about in finance, but it's not going to be making excessive profit, which is going to cause the share price to rise. For a small producer, say your local plumber or someone, the normal cost of production is sufficient income from selling the produce, whatever it is, to be able to pay for the producer's toil and trouble and other expenses in, in production, and includes risk and so on. The nice thing about normal cost is that normal cost can be evaluated objectively. What I mean by that is that you can scientifically observe the different numbers that go towards constructing normal cost. The place where this is really obvious is in the profit and loss statement, that very important, re important report that comes from our accounting process. The profit and loss statement if it's analysed from a finance point of view and a managerial finance point of view, is something where it basically takes all of the costs of production, includes things like repayment of interest and taxation and so on, and leads down to the conclusion, the bottom of the profit and loss statement, uh, which is the profit that goes to the shareholders. And, if, and so long as that profit is sufficient to satisfy the shareholders' need for profit, which is usually expressed as a percentage of the share value, then that profit loss statement is really a very precise, scientific, if you like, uh, statement of what arrangements in the company uh, will cause sufficient profit for the share price to remain stable. It's very objective. It's easy to manage, and that's a lot of what managerial finance is about. Um, in some sense, normal cost when a company decides to only charge its goods at its normal cost, requires a certain amount of self-restraint. If the farmer sees me coming down the road wanting a bucket of milk for my cornflakes or whatever, and sees, oh, they're small, he's got a lot of money, 
and he looks like he's really hungry for a glass of milk, I'll put my price up. And to a certain extent, the farmer will be able to do that because he's able to see my great need, my desire, the value I place on it. If the farmer there's no, uh, thinks to himself, no, um, I don't want to rip small off. Um, I will only sell him a reasonable amount so that I can continue to run my business and feed my kids and do all the other things I need to do. Then he will be exercising a certain degree of self-restraint. So normal cost often um, you don't see it in the economy um, because most mm, economic participants, certainly most producers, have an interest in maximising their sale price, not simply setting it at that normal level. However, the uh, normal cost, it's knowable through the profit and loss statement and a certain amount of uh, relatively elementary financial management uh, analysis. It's called it's knowable. And in a functioning economy where you're producing things which do have a solid demand, in order to hold back and simply sh uh, sell things for a price which will maintain a stable real share price requires a certain amount of self-restraint. And in our culture, just about no company would do that. If I was running a mobile phone company, for instance, there's no way I would charge you um, a price which leaves my share price at stable real levels. I would want to charge as much as you're willing to pay so that I'd be able to make my shareholders a bit more wealthy. That's basically the logic of uh, the financial markets. However, uh, the point here is to understand normal cost and to be able to see that normal cost is a knowable thing. It's above the bare cost. Obviously, you've got to make a profit yourself or at least a, enough of an income uh, to be able to keep the wheels of your business turning. Okay, normal cost is very, very important. Whenever we use the expression normal cost, or cost uh, in this course, in this unit, in this subject, uh, we're going to be always referring to normal cost. So it's a cost which uh, is not simply um, sufficient to pay for what you buy from the wholesaler. It, it actually sort of incorporates that level of income for the business, for the individual producer and what have you, to keep their business turning. Very, very important distinction. Okay, let's now look at commercial uh, community attitudes to price. If the price that the farmer sold his milk for was right up there at the very limit of what I was willing to pay before I simply turned around with my empty milk pail and came home, and if that was happening all the time, the community evaluation of that dairy farmer would be that they were well, he was ripping the community off. He was overcharging. There's this sense that if price equals value, then the purchaser or the community or whoever it is, is being exploited. And we have a lot of mechanisms in our society to stop that exploitation. We insist on a level of competition, say with mobile phone producers and other um, things in the community. We have a policy that um, controls our banks and makes sure there's, there's healthy competition in banks. Why is all of that competition um, you know, promoted both by the community through media action and community action and especially through the government? It's because there's this perception that if price is up there at the very maximum level I'm willing to pay, then for one way or another, it's a bad thing. It's exploitation. Now, if price equals normal cost, in economics, that is considered to be the optimum. And the reason is that the community gets all the things it needs for a reasonable price, and the producer gets to run his business very comfortably, making a nice profit and enjoying nice, stable uh, share prices. In other words, his business is going to continue to uh, you know, sail through time, being able to replace its capital assets as they wear out and all of the other things that normal cost uh, includes. And so the optimum, the economic optimum, is where price equals your normal cost, or the cost if you like. The really curious thing about when price equals normal cost is that while we use competition to achieve it, it actually discourages 
unhealthy competition, which would be likely to drive people out of business. That's something for you to think through in your own time. Now, unfortunately, between the bad and the best, the actual price sold them um, is right down at normal cost. In other words, the best for the, uh, the economy, it's somewhere in between. In economics, we talk about the quantity called economic rent. Economic rent is the gap between the price set by normal cost and the actual price. And the higher the price is above normal cost, is the more economic rent is in the sale. Economists will talk about rent taking. Now, we would see rent taking as something that the landlord does in property. But in general economics, rent taking is when some organization, a producer, say, or a supplier of something, is able to gouge out of the community excessive revenues, leading to excessive profits, because of some error, some um, fault in the market system. That's the way we describe it in normal economic parlance. We talk about market failure uh, in economics, and that's saying that the market has failed to provide sufficient competition to keep the prices down to that economic optimum, that optimum of the best price where everyone's happy. The producers are able to make enough to make ends meet and to live comfortably, and the uh, consumers are able to get their goods at a reasonable price. So now we have a different approach, if you like, to understanding the market. We can understand exploitation, which we can understand or perceive in um, ethical terms, in the terms that are comfortable in moral philosophy. We can see a, an objective ideal, which is the normal price, normal cost. Uh, and we can understand this quantity of economic rent as this gap between the uh, price that's coming from normal cost and what's actually happening. That's called market failure. Economics, the modern discipline, solves that puzzle, that problem, with competition. And that does work to a certain extent. I don't think we'll worry about classical value systems, but we will uh, look at the um, way that the market works now. Uh, I'll let you read about those classical systems in your own time. Let's look at the market. The object of economic intervention is to encourage competition. Let's look at the way that works according to modern economic theory. Here we have a graph showing uh, the supply and demand functions. You've seen these graphs many times before. What I want to do now is look at how that works when we're talking about a human system and the really human people. Okay, let's look at um, the, 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 the process. Normally, we're led to believe that the uh, ideal price comes when you have perfect market competition. In other words, where you have perfect knowledge, perfect mobility, perfect rationality, and perfect substitution. In other words, uh, I'm really indifferent to whether I bring home a pail of milk or a jug of orange juice. I'll put both of them on my cereal. Uh, so you've got to have substitution in there, or maybe a different uh, milk producer and so on. That seldom happens in, in practice. But if it did, there's forces in the market, having a large number of people, all with perfect knowledge and mobility, rationality and so on, are all able to negotiate, argy-bargy and so on, go home if they don't like the prices, and to send the prices down to the normal cost of supply. And that results in a just outcome. So even our modern economics, which uh, goes out of its way not to talk in terms of ethical or um, moral terms, is actually based on the idea of a just price. Let's look at that in practice. The intersection of supply and demand is normally considered to be the perfect market price. However, you can get the intersection of supply and demand in a number of different situations, largely because the supply and the demand isn't necessarily following these perfect concepts, these um, situations of 
many producers and consumers and perfect knowledge, all that stuff. Okay. So you can have a supply and demand function, which causes us to have an intersection point. Uh, the intersection point might be up there um, at the intersection of the green and the red line. And so it will give us a price in practice. And the market will always clear. In other words, all of the things that were brought to market will all be sold and be taken home by the consumer when supply equals demand. However, in most cases, if um, the uh, supply equals demand, if you don't have an economic, if you don't have a perfect market situation, there will be economic rent in the price. And so here in the graph, what we've done is added the normal cost of production uh, function. And we've measured there the dotted arrow line is showing us the economic rent. What happens? Over time, if the market does approach kind of some kind of you know, perfection, or at least gets a little bit closer to it, especially the uh, people buying things will realize, hang on, we're being ripped off here. We're paying a lot of economic rent to the supplier. And uh, if we were a bit more shrewd and maybe bargained a little bit more aggressively, we wouldn't have to pay so much. And so what will happen is that over a period of time, the demand curve might exist there, but uh, more suppliers will come into the market and they will cause the uh, price to fall. Uh, also, the uh, people uh, buying the products will become a bit more savvy and shop around amongst those uh, large number of producers. And down, down, down will go the price. Uh, notice at each point, the price is set by the intersection of supply and demand. It's simply that Suppliers increase because more people are saying, oh, you know, the dairy farmers are making a lot of money here. I'll go off and become a dairy farmer and they will come in and compete. Uh, also, the consumers will get more savvy and uh, they will only be prepared to pay a smaller price. So one way or another, the price will come down. Where does this fall in the price stop? Well, it stops when you get to the perfect market competition price, which happens to be where there's no economic rent, where the eventual price happens to be equal to the normal cost of production. Now, that's the way that the market really works. It's not simply a static thing with one supply function, one demand function. It has a bit more complexity to it. And ultimately, it's grounded on this notion of normal cost of supply. Here's the kicker. Land has no cost of production. Therefore, it has no normal cost of production. How then do you get a perfect price for land? If the perfect price in most economic transactions is based on the normal cost of production, where does the price of this thing, which has no normal cost of production, come from? That's a peculiar question. It's really the most important question in all of property economics. And it's one which, oddly enough, many property economists never actually think about through all of their professional careers and all of their education. But if you understand the answer to that question, you have a far deeper understanding of your discipline. And that means you have a far greater command in your professional lives. And this is what we're going to be looking at uh, as we move along. The way that the market and the functions of supply and demand are not actually able to give us a perfect market solution for the price of land is very, very important. It's not a surprise, though. It's not something which has only just been discovered in the last five years. It was something that Adam Smith recognized two and a half centuries ago, pretty much at the dawn of this discipline that we call modern economics. Smith was able to notice, to conclude, that land price is always the result of market imperfection. This is important because what Smith noted was that it was the imperfect market that gave us a price of land, and a perfect market, if it existed, would actually give us land for free. And we'd probably go out, rather than becoming property economists, we would go out and be involved in something else, perhaps something that is uh, 
more directly related to meeting human needs. Uh, we might bake bread or brew beer or something. This notion of imperfection is very important because connected with that is Smith's recognition that land prices and the land market always behaves like a monopoly. This is important because there is a social stigma attached to monopoly. I would like to be a monopolist. I would like to have you know, control over the um, you know, supply of all the milk in Australia so that I'd be able to set my own prices because I'd become fabulously wealthy. The only problem is I'd have to avoid all of the people who were chasing after me saying that some way I was exploiting the community and there'd be government um, institutions set up to stop me from being able to do that, break up my monopoly and uh, cause the milk industry to have real competition in it and all of those things we're very familiar with. And so the reality of land price being the result of imperfection and the deduction from that that it means that land price acts or land uh, market acts like a monopoly has quite profound implications for the society. Now this is done by the father of modern economics by the way, it's not by Karl Marx or what have you. If we understand that fact we are sort of clearing away a lot of the smoke and mirrors in the way that land price works and where the capital gain in land comes from. Because in a monopoly the price is not determined by the interaction of supply and demand and so on and that argy-bargy that gets us down to normal costs. Price is entirely determined by demand. The important thing about land is that we all have a need for it. We can't live without it. So there's always going to be some base level of physical demand and therefore economic demand. And so if the only thing which is causing land to have its value is demand, that sets a very important insight into its place in the whole economic process and for that matter its behaviour uh, within the political economy, um, especially of land as well. At the very least, if you understand that land behaves as a, as a monopoly uh, and that its value is set purely by demand, you're beginning to understand property value. And this is really what we're looking for, to get that deeper understanding of where it comes from and the mechanisms that really make it work. I hope in this presentation what we have done is, uh, first of all, distinguished between economics as the modern discipline and how it relates to political economy. And we've also looked particularly at the question of land and land value and some of the anomalies that are not able to be answered using modern economic thinking, in other words, market thinking. But we are able to see or begin to see the potential in the political economy perspective. So from this, we can move on later on to explore some of the questions that have been raised in these last few slides.